Um, so preoperative embolization uh, can be quite useful when you're going into this with a surgical standpoint. You definitely can reduce blood loss, um, cutting out some of the, um, the large feeding vessels and filling the nidus with glue can make it so it's a lot easier to deal with. Shortens the operative time and minimizes any hemodynamic changes. There is a, um, there is a phenomenon of breakthrough um, uh, perfusion hemorrhage that can you know, just vex the surgeon. You thought you got the whole thing out, patient goes to the ICU and all of a sudden they have a hemorrhage. So by um, changing the hemodynamics kind of slowly over time with the embolization first, um, you're able to minimize some of those hemodynamic changes going forward. Embolization does not necessarily interfere with, with resection. Um, there are some, uh, the Michael Morgans of the world down in Australia, or at least he was, um, suggesting that it's not necessary um, and that it's just adding risk to the procedure. It doesn't necessarily interfere. And if you can um, take out some of those deep feeders, um, I think many will, will agree that it's, um, it's a useful adjunct. Uh, it can help to reduce the effective grade of the lesion. Um, and then there are these other benefits that we've kind of talked about. And, and certainly one of them that I'll say from having been in the OR with these is really helping to identify that surgical margin. You now have um, something intra-op that you can look at and point to and say, aha, this is a vessel that I know corresponds to this on the angiogram, and that puts me here, and I need to go from, you know, do X, Y, or Z with that. Okay. Let's talk about embolization and radiosurgery. This is a little bit of a con uh, controversial topic. Some folks um, suggest that embolization and radiosurgery ought not go together. We tend to use it um, pretty liberally. Um, radiosurgery in general, I think, is a very good option for many lesions non-invasive outpatient patient uh, um, uh, has a reasonable rate of cure if they're a relatively low risk lesion, 80% obliteration rates um, for lesions that are less than 10 cc's. Hard to beat that either with surgery or with uh, glue. Um, and then the risks are relatively modest, 3% risk of radiation injury, delayed cyst formation. Um, there have been reports of gliomas or other uh, neoplasms, but again, that's pretty rare. Um, and then the downside, of course, is that two to three year lag time. Often, um, even if radiosurgery fails, folks will subject the patient to a second round before going on with something more invasive. Um, obviously that's center dependent, uh, but that time lag is, is real. Okay. Predictors of success. Here's a, a useful uh, handy dandy equation for you guys, but essentially uh, the AVM volume um, uh, correlates with success patient age correlates with success and the lesion location correlates with success. So younger patients, smaller volumes, more superficial location is gonna portend a, a better outcome. Perhaps no, no uh, surprise there. Large AVMs, um, this is one that we looked at at UCSF where um, we do volume staging of the AVM where you kind of break it down into more manageable, uh, smaller volume targets and you independently target those and treat those separately. Uh, but the effect is um, quite substantial and you can actually have very good um, uh, outcomes with that, okay? Things change over time, right? So um, planning has improved, neuro, uh, neuroangiography has improved, our tools have improved. And so this is a moving target, no doubt. Um, so I think that this is something that is gonna continue. This is a story that's gonna continue to be written um, and uh, that people are gonna continue to argue about. But the truth is, I think all of these techniques have a place in our armamentarium and are very useful to be able to, um, to, to go after this very vexing disease. Um, now, with that being said, um, let's look at some, some cases. I think these are uh, often more interesting for folks. And so let's, let's look at um, some of the things that we can do. If there are questions, by all means, put them in the chat. We can, we can stop to chat about them. This is a case where embolization and radiosurgery were used together because it's a pretty, it's pretty high priced real estate. So um, if we actually had you guys up on the screen, I'd, screen, I'd uh, quiz one or more of you about what it is we're seeing here, but since we don't, I'll just kind of walk you through it. So um, here you can see in the upper left, we've got the um, a lateral projection in ICA. You can see a very large posterior communicating coming back and off of that is that nidus. Here we've got um, draining vessels going back into straight uh, Galen. This is now um, a vertebral artery injection, and you can see off of the posterior choroidal, um, the LPCHA, the lateral posterior choroidal artery, you see the nidus coming off from that right side of PCA branch. This is what it looks like in lateral, and you can see the, the nidus broken up into two points. 
This is high priced real estate. Thalamic AVMs, you can take them out. You're going to hurt the patient. Not worth it. What can we do to um, reduce the risk of, uh, of uh, radio surgery for this kind of a patient? Well, glue can certainly help. So perhaps we can take out at least one of these um, foci, the nidus, um, and make the radiosurgical targeting easier. So that's in fact what we did. Going in, we can get into the LPCHA, um, fill it with onyx. You can see there's dramatic reduction in the filling from that. And then we're able to have a smaller volume. You don't have to worry about targeting all this stuff out back. Um, it's now a much more manageable and feasible target going from sort of this large oval um, on the left down to something uh, much smaller on the right, higher dose, less tissue at risk, um, high, uh, better outcomes or something like that. Okay. So, um, so those are uh, sort of the, you know, what we're looking to, to be able to achieve with these combination therapies. Um, the, let's, let's look um, now at the issue of sort of the nidal aneurysm. So this patient comes into you with um, a ruptured uh, ABM. The question is, what do you do with this, right? The patient needs to be treated in some form or fashion, but how are you going to affect um, the, the greatest bang for buck and subject them to the lowest risk? When you look at this um, uh, angiogram in total, it can be a little difficult to decipher. What we can see is that there's probably a little something over here that's gonna draw our attention. If that's actually an aneurysm, that's probably our rupture point. You can probably correlate that on a CTA or an MRA with where the hemorrhage is and see, you know, does this actually make sense with what we think is happening with this patient? Here we can then go in with our microcatheter, go up, and selectively embolize that feeding artery aneurysm. We may or may not get the rest of this nidus, but if we've reduced that risk of re-rupture in the short term dramatically by taking out that aneurysm, that's worthwhile. Now we can let the patient cool down, um, think about what do we wanna do with the rest of this? What are the risks? How is the patient gonna do from the initial hemorrhage? Um, and, and that's the advantage of being able to, to kind of dissect these. Here you can see this is one that we've been able to take a staged approach gluing over time. Um, and here again is that nidal aneurysm uh, that we were able to glue shut and, and get a fairly good result. The, the residual that it may, may or may not be in high risk territory, maybe that's something that's good for gamma knife down the road. Uh, and you don't have to deal with it up front because you've taken that risk of hemorrhage sort of off the table up front. Um, all right, so we've kind of talked about all of these things. Let's let's think about sort of that one of those other um, kind of rare things that we talked about, but something that can be very difficult: the fistulous connection, where you've got a direct connection between artery and vein. Um, if you look at the angiogram on the left, that is really hard to interpret. There's dye flowing everywhere. It's very high flow, and it can be difficult to understand the angio architecture simply because you can't see well enough. It turns out when you start to micro explore this that there's a fistula. Okay, and you can see here, we've gotten our catheter way out and around and down here, and now we're injecting just through the microcatheter. And you can see even then when you're just already directly in that vessel, the flow is so high that the dye is just immediately washing out and it's hard to see. What we do in cases like that is we can selectively embolize the fistula, in this case, using a coil. So we're not trying to go from zero or 60 to zero, I guess. Um, and, and shut this off in, uh, immediately. What we're trying to do is slow it down, right? If you shut it off entirely, sometimes that can increase rupture risk, by, but, but by putting a coil in, you're adding outflow resistance and changing the hemodynamics. It'll likely go away over time, but in the short term, um, you're at least uh, reducing the risk of it um, uh, rupturing, okay? Uh, and giving yourself a better ability to, to see. So this is what that fistula now looks like, partially coiled. And now when you do a bigger, um, you know, global angiogram, you can see sort of how it's put together. The arteries plugging in, the nidus, the vein coming out, and that can help you with further treatment planning, okay? Um, so that's one of the, um, the, the, the nice um, uh, treatment modalities. And in this case, um, they decided to go with radio surgery, targeting a smaller volume because they were able to kind of see what it is um, that they needed to target. And knowing what you're targeting is, is the whole key with, um, with radio surgery. We're gonna skip over some. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.